A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences from writers to musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Claudette Johnson, who's created some of the most powerful figurative art of recent years, working primarily in what she's called the very small, twisted space offered to black women in art. She uses drawing and painting together in works that are bold yet sensitive imposing in scale and intimate in their handling. She subverts the conventions of portraiture in her dramatic approach to composition and pose and in foregrounding the figure's presence in the viewer's space rather than establishing the context in which they're depicted. As a result, she confronts the historic invisibility, distortion and denial of black subjects and particularly black women in art. Claudette was born in 1959 in Manchester in the UK and now lives in London. She studied at the Wolverhampton Polytechnic and in 1981 was one of the founders of the Black Art Group there, alongside artists including Marlene Smith and Keith Piper. In these early years, she developed a distinctive style which she called semi-abstract, with works like Untitled, Woman with Earring and And I Have My Own Business in This Skin, both made in 1982. They are partly fractured representations of naked black women, clearly responsible Responding to modernist styles like Cubism. Strikingly, the women fill the space of the composition and meet our gaze head on. Johnson's written that she wanted to take on the entrenched passivity and negative sexuality of the new tradition in painting and to get back to basic questions of identity and sexuality. The same year that she made these works, she took part in the first National Black Art Convention in Wolverhampton. She gave a presentation in which she was explaining her work's distinctiveness from old masters when she was interrupted from the floor. The ensuing heated debate prompted a breakout group of women artists to gather. Joining Claudette were Sonia Boyce, Lubaina Hamid, Ingrid Pollard and Marlene Smith, all now regarded as leading lights of that generation, who, like Claudette, are only now getting the attention they have long deserved. With them and others, Claudette showed in a series of hugely important shows, including Five Black Women at the Africa Centre in London in 1983 and The Thin Black Line at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London in 1985. Claudette continued to focus on individual subjects as her work developed, a deliberate strategy to increase her work's directness, as there was no competition for the viewer's gaze, as she put it. She experimented with multiple presentations of these individual figures in pastel, gouache paint and watercolour. Trilogy, made between 1982 and 1986, depicts three women, one in blue, one in black and the other in red and white, united by their monumental presence within the rectangle of the picture. All of them are tightly framed so that you don't see the top of their heads or their feet. Meanwhile, in Untitled 1987, she worked from the test strips created through the process of developing analogue photographs to depict the same woman three times in a single image, with distinct approaches to colour, finish and material. Though she often draws her sitters from life, found imagery and photographic sources have proved hugely important to her. She's also used herself as a model. Among the most powerful pieces made in the first phase of her career is Afterbirth from 1990, a large self-portrait drawing in pastel made after Claudette had had her second child. Like so much of Claudette's work, it's an attempt to describe her own experience acutely, an aspect she sees as essential if the work is to achieve her desired honesty. From the mid-1990s to the mid-2010s, Claudette taught and continued to make work, but showed very little of it. It was only after an exhibition at the Hollybush Gardens Gallery in 20. 2015, at the invitation of Lubaina Himid, that she began to gain due attention, which has prompted a new flourishing of her work. She's continued to use some of the same materials, like pastel and gouache, but also returned to oil paint for the first time in decades. And in terms of content, she's pushed into ambitious new territories, though women have remained a consistent focus, and she's produced some of the most striking depictions of female sitters in her entire career. She's also turned to male subjects for the first time, inspired by the vulnerability in society of black men. She's also made several images of multiple figures, often from photographs, whether that's family snapshots, found images of key figures in black culture, or photojournalistic imagery. And she's built on the references in her very earliest works to the depictions of African objects and people in Western modernism and art history more widely. 
Formerly, she remains experimental, using the effects of pastel and paint to create differing levels of poetry and intimacy. Across the decades, she's had a disarming approach to questions of completion, leaving fragments of compositions relatively unresolved or open where others are highly finished and detailed. And it's this approach with which I began our conversation. Speaking about this subject, she explained that it was a deliberate attempt to put black bodies together again in the work, but reflecting the discontinuities in our histories. I asked if she might explain a little more. Yeah, I mean, that quote refers to a particular piece of work from 1982 or 83, I Came to Dance. Mm. And there, thinking about the role of dance in its positive and negative senses for black people in terms of our history, and wanting to make a drawing where the spaces reflected that history as much as the um, line and um, developed areas. And then kind of through that work, that became a kind of element that I wanted to keep in play in the work. So I suppose I have an idea about um, working with images of black people that is concerned with the difficulty of telling something that might seem like a continuous or whole story. I don't know how to do that, and I don't have that history myself, and so the work reflects the gaps that I feel I have in my own history, as well as, in a broader sense, most diasporic black Caribbean people have too. And it seems to me that relates very closely to this idea you have of putting people in space. But when you talk about space, it seems to me you're talking about it in all the broad associations of that word, societal space, art historical space, and of course, literal pictorial space. So tell me more about that. Yes, I think I I knew straight away that my drawings of black people were not going to feature furniture or um, references to their lifestyle in terms of housing or, or location because I, I really wanted to centre things on the body itself and tell as much of a story as I could with the body. A big part of it is that I think about it pictorially and I think, how am I going to use space in this work? Where is the body going to sit? You know, it's going to have a centre and it's going to extend out from the centre and as it moves towards the peripheries, um, the space is going to play more of a role. But sometimes that space comes into the centre of the work And that's also fine. So although I'm thinking about space, as you said, very succinctly in terms of history and um, society and our place in the world, the way it's used in the work, I suppose my starting point is always how to use space pictorially to tell the story I want to tell with those bodies. And it seems to me that right from the start, there were some quite radical gestures that you made. I love those sort of forms that cut through the works that you made the way that you can make a mark which is self-evidently saying i am disrupting what you expect of a surface in a way oh yeah so you're thinking of works like and i have my own business in this skin yeah i mean interestingly a work like and i have my own business in this skin or um, woman with earring or Mm. i came to dance were very driven by a kind of opening line or a closing line, and so sometimes I would begin by um, choosing to make a line that maybe bisected the the area, and then I'd build the figure out of that line. And other times, with work like, and I have my own business in this skin, the line that bisects the figure came right at the end and was about the, just a freeing moment of realising I could exaggerate what was happening in the body with this with this single jagged line and I really do think some of the inspiration for that came from that Picasso work that I've talked about so many times before the Demoiselle d'Avignon I do think that um, the way he's breaking space in that work was inspirational for me yeah one thing I'm really intrigued by in the work is this sort of balance between the personal information if you like in the sense that you've said you know, it has to be from your own experience, that that way you can be sure that it's honest. But when, for instance, you depict yourself, you're not calling it self-portrait. 
No. You will call it standing figure or so it's an intriguing give and take between a kind of personal content and a pictorial content again. And that, that feeds into the negotiations with space that we were talking about. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure for most artists, their work is to some extent biographical. And of course, if I, if I use myself in an image, then it references me. But I don't think of it as a drawing that's about me. And you know, when I stand in front of a mirror, I kind of stop being me. I don't see myself. I see this interesting play of light and shade and line possibilities. And, and that's what I work with. And then I think what I arrive at is a figure that hopefully has some kind of charge that belongs to more than just me, you know, is bigger than just me. And the terminology that you use to describe the work also feeds into that, doesn't it? Because there's this idea that you've you know, categorically said that you're painting naked women, not nudes. Mm. And there's, that plays into a, a, you know, a, a long debate, of course. But it's, it's important to you that that is the case. Right? Yes, because, I don't know, it's a kind of dressing up idea to me. The word nude carries that. And of course, there's this long, long centuries old history of an approach to painting women an approach that was um, first made by male artists. Um, it just isn't what I want to do. It doesn't interest me to do that. That's not to say that I don't value some of the work that's been made, but it's not what I'm trying to do. And I think naked, when you talk about working with a naked woman, a naked form, then you've shorn it of all the trappings of ancient ideas of beauty and a certain type of value. It comes back to the idea of, honesty about making yes. an honest statement yes yeah, stripping away as much as I can of, of the history that I of course came out of you know was educated into you know I still want to yeah challenge that yeah but an education which didn't provide you with any books which told you about black British artists you said that there were some about African-American artists but, yes. but, but nothing about black British art not that I can recall ever finding in my art school library so yes it felt like a vacuum yeah I want to explore sources a bit because it seems to me there's this really intriguing thing when you look at your work you might imagine that all of it was drawn from life Mm -hmm. but you've got this really interesting relationship with photographic sources it seems to me Mm -hmm. and I wonder how schematic your approach to drawing from life or drawing from found imagery is 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 it different from day to day or is it something right right, I'm going to work with found images now (laughs) no no, it's entirely as the moment and mood takes me. And sometimes I have an image around me for a long time and then I think, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to work with that. But I, I also think that when I work on a found image, I don't think I approach it very differently than when the subject's actually in front of me. You know, you, you can, you can take a, a photograph and you can divide it up into squares and then you can reproduce, you know, and you can get an absolutely accurate reproduction that's not my interest so I approach it much as I do when someone's sitting in front of me I try and find my way around the image as if it were in front of me and I I try not to be tricked by the flattening that happens with a photograph so I try and bring what I know to what is actually in front of me and there's also a bit of imagination there's also mistakes and you know, there are things that I don't feel I've quite got the hang of, but you know, I'll just grapple with it. I can't go that towards just a reproduction of what I'm starting with. You know, it has to carry this journey of finding out something by using that source. And sometimes you can do quite innovative things with that. Like, for instance, there's that work from 1987, Untitled, where you've got test strips from photographs alongside life drawing. Is that right? So it's a kind of mix of imagery. Yes, yeah. yes, that's right. So um, I used to do, do a lot of black and white photography. I used to teach photography, very basic photography for quite a long time. And yeah, I always thought the test strips were one of the most enjoyable bits. You know, it's just fun. I would take test strips and then stick them alongside each other and kind of look at the different development times and make a choice. But um, it occurred to me when I had a set of three that I'd laid out that I really liked the way they sat together and they then became, yeah, the, the source for that untitled 1987 work. Yeah, and it adds 
up, I think, in, in everything we've discussed to this sort of complexity, it seems to me, that, that every image isn't readable immediately on the surface as a singular thing. There is always a complexity that you can read at one point in the journey with the work. Would you say that's fair? Well, I like that reading of it. <laughs> I hope so. Yes, I think as the work progresses, there are more and more things that I, I want to grapple with. Yeah, I say that and then I think that's not completely accurate because sometimes the work has a fairly straightforward development and other times I sit with it you know, for months, sometimes even years, before I come back and say, oh yeah, I know where to go with this now. I wanted to talk to you about the entry of depictions of black men in your work because it's clear that you made a very deliberate choice here and you use this phrase that they were targeted and vilified and you wanted to explore that in the work. Was there a particular incident or was it a sort of, in a way, a kind of accumulation of relentless targeting and vilification that you were, you were responding to? Well, there was a specific image that brought me into depicting black men, which was, yeah, which was an image I saw in a newspaper article, I think. And I suppose it just crystallized something I've been thinking about for a long time, which is the vulnerability of black men in terms of how they're viewed by the wider society. Somehow that came into focus in a way that it hadn't when I was when I was younger. When I was young, I was very focused on black women that we we needed to be seen, we needed to be heard, we needed to be visible. That's what needed to be my focus. Whereas more recently, I feel I've got something to say about what's happening for black men and I want them to be present in the work. And someone speculated recently that maybe this was the result of my, I have two sons, uh, young men, and I, I worry about them in the world, although they're doing fine. So that's not an unreasonable assumption to make. But I think it's, again, the, the wider political sense of what it means to represent black male figures in my work and and what I can bring to how I represent them that might tell a different story than the one people are used to thinking about. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? I do think it was Rembrandt. I remember a book we had at school when I was doing my um, GCEs, as they were called, their my level art. My teacher had this book on her shelf that was um, beautifully bound, one of those very thick vellum yellow pages. Oh, nice. It yeah. had proper reproductions of the work as separate inserts and it was called the world's greatest paintings no irony <laughs> <laughs> of course it was it wasn't entirely men but mostly anyway Rembrandt had quite a few plates of his work and I remember really examining a work I think it's portrait of Margareta somebody mm. and there's a man in in armor yeah. in profile um and then I just would really examine them. And then I, I used to make these ink works that tried to emulate the chiaroscuro that he was using in his works. I wanted to also ask about Toulouse Lautrec, because I know that he too was an early influence. And there's an intriguing point that Dorothy Price in an essay about your work raises that you used perhaps a reference to to lose a trek or maybe it was an unconscious reference in, in the friends in pink and yellow which is this extraordinary portrait from a photograph of thomas sankara and fellow Kuti, and and they have this extraordinary effect on their arms where the coloring is very particular and it has a kind of latrekian feel is that a direct reference no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i love it but i mean i i look at his work very frequently I'm moved by his line, actually, mm. as well as inspired by it. So I'd love it if there was something that felt like a reference or emulated it in some way, but it wasn't conscious now. Uh, which historical artist do you turn to the most today? I mean, it does shift around. So at the moment, I have been looking at the track a lot in the past two years, I'd say. But we also had um, a flirtation with 
Hyponard, I think it was. Mm. I saw some of his drawings and I thought, oh, wow, well, those look very interesting. And then when I went to New York earlier this year and saw the Demoiselle for the first time in real life ah. and saw the scale and the color, and we had a couple of minutes with it, unfortunately, but whew, it still does something to me. You've said that when you saw that for the first time in reproduction, in you were in your second year at Wolverhampton, is that yeah, right? Yeah, I think so, it's the beginning of my first year. And you described year. it as a critical moment in terms of those semi-abstract works that we were talking about earlier on. Yeah, I definitely felt I can... I don't have to work from life, I can work from my imagination. I can start to let my imagination really run wild, which is what I did. And, of course, in recent years you've revisited it to a certain extent with... Well, I, I don't know, tell me, I think it's two works... Standing figure and figure with figurine, yeah, which seemed to me to almost directly quote, but not quite, but certainly reference Demoiselle. Yes, that's right. Tell me more about why you wanted to engage with it again after such a long time, and almost more directly in terms. It it almost feels like the standing figure is you in front of what could be a reproduction of an artwork. Mm -hmm. Although for me, the the figures that I've referred to as African masks in that standing figure work. Yeah, I, th I think yeah, I think they probably do refer to Les Demoiselles to some extent. But I was trying to think about my relationship with West African sculpture and mask making, and I was trying to speak across that distance of my experience as a black British woman and my interest and my contact with this Picasso work and my contact with the, you know, masks in museums and in books. And it's not part of my history in the same way, but it feels that there's a charge that it has for me that, that becomes exciting when I, when I bring it into contact with a live figure, in this case myself. Hmm. So I was trying to speak about all the different connections and that it's, it's a fractured dialogue you know it's it's slightly uncomfortable and it's certainly unresolved for me but I wanted to put those things in play together in the same space and see what they did that's really fascinating when you were a second year student you talked about the sort of leap of imagination that seeing the Picasso gave you were the problematics also there did you respond to it in a kind of wary way as well as a kind of excited way if you know what I mean I was wary of Picasso to some extent. But I should point out that when I made um, Standing Figure with African Masks, I was actually looking back to my own work and I have my own business in this skin. And that was the work that had referred back more directly to Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. That work, looking back at that work again, or at least thinking about, and I have my own business in this skin, and thinking about its links to that earlier work, really allows me to return to some of the things I was trying to talk about in that um, Wolverhampton conference when I presented my own work, where I was, I was using the form of modernism and um, early modernists, but I believed I was saying something quite perhaps original or direct about um, black female experience. And I think where my work departs from Picasso's is in that I am trying to subvert that male gaze. So I am trying to introduce another gaze, a black feminist gaze, if you like. You mentioned your lecture at the National Convention of Black Art there. And actually, as part of that, you're talking about Velasquez and Manet in relation to your own practice. And it becomes a kind of seminal moment because it causes a kind of debate at the National Black Art Convention, which eventually leads to the, to the women at the convention sort of breaking off into a separate group and kickstarting all sorts of associations, which are really, really kind of creative and wonderful. Yeah. But it seems to me that it's extraordinary that there's this moment where you are placing your work in the context of historical art and it caused an enormous kind of debate at that convention. Yes. <laughs> It did seem as though, maybe not quite half, but a percentage of the convention didn't want to talk about that as a whole group, didn't want to talk about what I was doing in my work that might be different from what those artists had been doing in theirs. Didn't feel it was important enough, didn't feel this was the place. This was a little, you know, little thing for women to talk about amongst themselves, but not for a whole 
convention to talk about. And so the breaking off, it, it was a breaking off, but it had always been timetabled that I would lead a workshop with women. So in that way, it was, it kind of happened prematurely and, and, and not in quite the way that we wanted it to, but it would have happened anyway. And those connections would have been made anyway. Right. Among the people that you met that day was Lubaina Hamid. And we're going to talk about contemporary artists now. I do want to talk about Lubaina because she's such an extraordinary figure, both in your early work and also more recently too. As well as being an artist, she was a curator and sort of instigator of all sorts of stuff, wasn't she? Yeah. I remember when the women's group broke off and we met in my studio on the sixth floor of the Wolverhampton university as it was by then we all kind of tried to show each other images of each other's work and Lubaina showed me some slides as they were then of um, her work I had never seen anything anything like it you know her, the men with um, paint brushes that were actually penises or things yeah. that were actually paint brushes you know and so bold and and so so acute but this kind of passion to them you know, it was a really special moment seeing her work for the first time. And then as a person, you know, her, her dynamism and her vision for where we could go as artists and her willingness to put the energy in to making those early important shows happen was fantastic. You know? and, and, and she was the gathering force from that point. I mean, you know, she, she got us all to send us her slides. You know, she got us together. And throughout the 80s, we would have meetings at her house and you know, she would just open up her doors um, to these gatherings of black women artists to, to ensure that what began at that convention was really sustained in a way that then anyone else had, I don't know, maybe the vision, resources, energy to make that happen. And then more recently, I hear she was instrumental in you picking up your pastel and and gouache brush and everything else. Is that right? Is it, you know, um, I know that you were making work when you weren't exhibiting, but but it seems to me that there was a period around 2014 where you really started making work in earnest again. And yeah, and and is it right that Lubaina had a role in prompting you to do it with particular gusto? (laughs) Absolutely. She invited me to be in a show that she was curating at Holly Bush Gardens and I don't know when I'd last been invited to be in a show, but it's been a long time. And she kind of encouraged me to talk about what would help me to to make that work for that show. And she helped provide the conditions that made it possible to make work again. And also she was the first sounding board for that new work. I remember sending her an image and saying, oh, do you think this is okay? She <laughs> said, oh, it's, yeah, she was great. So validating and supportive yeah I wanted to ask you about that period between well in your exhibition history it looks like 1999 to 2014 where you were making work but not exhibiting I mean I did show in my little studio in Hackney ah right okay yeah right yeah but I wanted to ask you about the work that you were making in that period because I know that you talked about how you make warm-up sketches which you talk about keeping the hand moving is that the kind of work that you were making in that period or were you making major work that we haven't yet come across no if I was doing small things small scale or smaller scale really just drawings to keep my hand moving I wasn't conceiving big complex pieces at all partly no I'd given up my studio by then so I Mm. didn't have a space to make large works but it, it wasn't just that because I've made work on my kitchen wall when I've needed to that work that we talked about earlier the triptych within a work yeah. um, untitled 1987 I made that on my kitchen wall because I didn't have a studio at the time so I know it's not just about having a space it's about what's happening in, you know, mm. psychologically in my head whether I have the head space to give the physical space to the work from my point of view the warm up sketches which you've started to show I think they're wonderful things. They have that intimacy, but they're also they're so structurally powerful as well. It seems to me that it was a revelation because I'd seen your work on a large scale, but then to see the smaller pieces, it st- seems to me that they, they don't seem just like warm-ups. They do genuinely feel like works in their own right. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they were sketchbook works, which I just did for myself. And, and I do, you know, I've got something big that I'm working on. I don't feel ready 
to go and make any marks on it. I might get my inks out and then just do some drawing in a in a sketchbook. And I don't sketch in the sense of making a preparatory sketch that then becomes the basis of a larger work. The sketches are just what they are in, in and of themselves. Brushwith is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 250 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Among the most recent additions to the app are the University of Dundee Museums in Scotland, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles, and Perelman Performing Arts Centre, or PAC, in New York. Among the other guides on Bloomberg Connects is The Courtold, where Claudette Johnson has a major show in autumn 2023. If you download the app, you'll find that the the Courtauld Guide has sections on temporary exhibitions alongside in-depth features on the gallery's collection. It includes detailed analysis of the displays on each floor with audio content on many of its most celebrated works. There are also videos that reveal hidden details of nine works, including those by Palma Giannino, Michelangelo, Turner and Sura. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. Which other contemporary artists do you admire? Yeah, I do admire Paul Arego. I spent a long time at her um, big Tate show. I can't remember what year that was. Was that two years two ago? Two years ago, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I first saw her work, I found it really difficult to look at. I mean, it is difficult to look at, and mm. obviously intentionally so. But I think until I saw the works face-to-face, I didn't realise how beguiling her use of um, materials is and how, for me, it took me into the pictorial space in a way that I found really exciting. And, and also she, she is using pastels in an extraordinary, incredibly skilled way. And I, I learn a lot by just looking at how she's applied the pastel, how she's moved it, what she's described with it. It's interesting that she chose pastel as her medium. Yes, and rejected painting, effectively. Yes, yeah. You've never quite rejected, but I know pastel has been your primary medium, but you've added it with gouache and now you've gone back to oils, for instance. So it's an intriguing thing. She, for her, the brush was sort of too significant an intervention between her and the surface. Yeah. That then makes it an intriguing thing in terms of your work because you have, again, different registers of mark making. Yeah, yeah she said something interesting about, wasn't it do with aggression and pastels? So mm. it, it was quite an aggressive act to work with pastels and I and I really that resonates with me because again going back to those early works when I first started working with pastels the immediacy of the mark you get a very strong mark immediately you can produce quite an impactful image very very quickly there's no waiting whereas with um, paints you have to wait even if it's gouache you have to wait for it to dry with pastels you don't have to wait so that's one thing but also it's the physicality of it that but I feel I can get my whole body into the mark that arrives in the work, you know, that it will retain my body in a way, in, mm. in the mark, in a way that paint does something else. Right. You've talked about pastel more in relation to sculpture, actually. Which is yes, yes. I think I'm a, a nascent sculptor. <laughs> because it feels as if I, I can kind of mould with it. I mean, and I work slightly differently now than I did as a young woman in that I used to um, push the paddles around with my fingers a lot. And I, nowadays I don't do that so much because I want to to leave the mark of the pastel. I don't want to blend it into the into the surface. And then, again, I do think that's something I picked up from Paula Rego because she lays it in, in kind of sways or sheets over the surface over and over again, which I, I really like. Uh, what do you have pinned to the studio wall? Well, surprise, surprise, I have Rembrandt's Young Woman Sleeping. I have a small postcard of that pinned to the wall. I've got a little pastel A4 study that I like that I made, I think, earlier this year. I've got a picture of my two boys photograph. <laughs> do you still have the picture of Stuart Hall that you made? I do. That's on my desk. That's a- I wasn't that happy with it when I made it, but 
because it, again, it was just about getting back into using oils and, um, I struggled for a bit and then I eventually got somewhere that I thought, oh, this is okay. And it was made to give the committee who'd commissioned the Stuart Hall portrait an idea of how I'd approach the final portrait. Actually, it didn't give much of an idea because the final portrait is very different no, right. <laughs> than this one. But I kept it up there because it has got something and yeah. I, I quite like looking at it every now and again. He's such a talismanic presence for so many of us. Oh, right? absolutely. He's just an extraordinary writer and just thinker and sociologist actually was his job but but yeah you know just uh so influential in so many different ways absolutely and he was a very lovely man from what i knew of him and um i have a very some very positive memories of his warmth and supportiveness towards me as a young artist which museum or gallery do you visit the most tate modern followed by Whitechapel. I think maybe that's because they're kind of local, you know, from Hackney, it's pretty easy to get to Tate Modern or to the Whitechapel. I think I think I just love the building, the Tate Modern, the building, as well as um, something about the way you can move around that space and the way the works are presented. I think I even enjoy the walk across the Millennium Bridge to the Tate. You know, it's all part of the experience of, of going there. There's something that feels fresh about it and exciting and and at the same time as if it belongs to me. Yeah, I think that's what is so extraordinary about it is that you can now walk basically from St Paul's Cathedral over to what was Bankside Power Station and completely cut off to the public. And yes, yeah. It's extraordinary that such, an, such a central part of London was sort of not a very public part of London for some reason. You're right, the bridge in Tate Modern has this incredibly public spiritedness. Yeah. I'd forgotten it was like that before. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It's it the was. closed power station belching coal into the London yeah. sky. <laughs> You're doing a show at the Courtauld. Mm-hmm. And of course, whenever you do a show at the Courtauld, inevitably there's an element of its history that must creep into your thinking. Has that been an easy process? Has that been something that you've enjoyed? Because I know that sometimes exhibiting in spaces which are full of historic works and masterpieces, it can be kind of a weighty kind of experience. Yes. I'm really curious about how the work will sit alongside you know, the very venerable collections that they have. I mean, there's lots of work there that I love, you know, Van Gogh and um, Lautrec, of course, and Gauguin, another contagious figure. <laughs> um, but I've speculated about how the work will be read in that space, whether there will be cross readings, whether it will feel that there is a conversation between work made with a gap of 120, 150 years, whatever. But it feels very exciting to me that, that this is happening, that this we've arrived at a moment where somebody thinks it's an interesting thing to do, to put my work in that setting. So I'm excited about it. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? Listening to Burning by Bob Marley. I remember my sister came home from her first year at university and maybe she just bought a stereo record player and we set it up in the living room and put the speakers onto the mantelpiece. And she put Burnin on, which is um, one of, I think, three albums that um, Bob Marley and the Whalers, in fact, they were the Whalers at the time, mm. made together. And it was the first time I'd heard reggae that was speaking about social issues, about the political situation in Jamaica. And, and the conditions that people were living in. You know, and it wasn't soul, it wasn't jazz, it was a whole new music that was, was just transformative. And until that point, I'd listened to ska and um, blue beat and finally reggae, but the reggae we'd listened to had been often covers of soul music. So this was original, authentic, a new sound, new message new music and it yeah that definitely changed something for me that was an important moment your grandmother was still in jamaica then yes, right? yeah and it seems to me that that is a really important painting of yours that you've made recently called reunion which is your mother and your grandmother yes. in a sort of snapshot but made into a painting tell me what it says about them of course but also about jamaica the um, painting records the moment when my mother 
visited Jamaica after a 30 year absence. And it was my first visit to Jamaica when they met, when they saw each other. I could see the child in my mother for the first time. You know, she was a, she's probably my age, she was 60, I think, at that point in time. So it's about whatever dreams and hopes she'd taken away with her and left as a young woman, she returned as a woman in her early 60s. My grandmother by that time was in her 80s, of course. And yet all of that kind of dissolved when they, when they were in each other's presence. My mother used to say that, not that she didn't feel Jamaican anymore, but that she wasn't seen as Jamaican anymore when she returned after that three-decade absence. So something about that coming together, although it was a joyful thing, though a lot had changed. And you capture that joy in the snapshot and the, and the painting. It was definitely about the joy, yeah, of that work, which is quite rare in my work to have <laughs> um, <laughs> that kind of joy. Which brings me to the question, which is, do you attempt to capture particular moods in the work? Because sometimes they can appear confrontational. At other times, one doesn't really know where the mood of the painting is to a certain degree. You're, in a way, you're leaving it up to the viewer to, to decide. Mm. So would you approach images with a particular mood in mind? Or in a way, are you dealing much more with the kind of pictorial <laughs> possibilities that you were discussing earlier? Mm. I have quite often worked to try and ensure that there is some tension in the work. That's something that was important to me from very early on. So sometimes the sitters are positioned in ways that are not entirely comfortable for them. So they're twisting towards me or, as you were saying at the beginning, it's something about trying to encourage a less easy reading of the work. And then we're complex beings and you're being confronted with something that you need to take a little bit of time to understand. So so partly I try and bring this, I think Dorothy Price called it contraposto movement into some of the works. Which writers or poets do you return to? One of the writers that I returned to recently is Arundhati Roy, her book, The God of Small Things, for which she won the Booker Prize, I think. She certainly won some things with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I loved that book and yeah. I still love it. And I, I read the opening lines of it again relatively recently and was pulled in again to that fantastic world that she creates and uh, I don't know, I just love her writing. So, mm. yeah, I, I come back to her. But Tony Cade Bambara, a black African-American mm. writer, James Baldwin, I mean, there were so many. Mm. You've said how Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, you said that from the moment that I read The Bluest Eye, I knew that I wanted to focus on the black woman as subject. That's an extraordinary effect of literature to prompt you to, yeah. Yes, it was about her seeing, you know, I mean, people talk about that art is about seeing. In order to draw, you have to first be able to see. With that novel, along with many others of hers, she described a kind of seeing of the black community that I hadn't seen in print before. And there was something very unashamed about it, you know, just a complete commitment to looking at these people in all of their complexity and difficulty. And I felt, yeah, that's, that's where I want to go. That's what I want to bring to my work, that kind of unflinching looking. One of the things about Toni Morrison is that I find it, she's so extraordinary that I have to kind of put the book down and kind of breathe for a bit. I read Song of Solomon recently. Yes. And, and, oh, and that I, great? Honestly, I'm astonished by the prose. It's hard in a way because it's so precise and she's so unflinching. Yes. And that, I, I, yeah, I reread again that opening Oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? With the, yeah. He's about to f try and fly yeah, all a people. A man is going to jump off a building. Yes, but he calls it flying, doesn't yeah. he? He says he's going to fly home. Mm. Oh, it's so brilliant. I read that again recently and thought, oh. I, I started to imagine work that I could make because that idea of flight, that wanting to be free of the burdens of living and, and of racism and all the oppressions that he'd faced in his life, yeah, I really thought it, I'd like to explore that in the work at some point. And I, I had this plan to have these figures in flight 
just from reading that opening again. How amazing. But it, it's so beautiful. It's astonishing. And also, I suppose there's also a bit of a corollary between you and Toni Morrison in the sense that that was her book where she went, OK, I'm going to tackle the male experience in this book. Yes, that's, that's true. I, didn't, yeah. I hadn't realised that. <laughs> Yes. I was intrigued to read that you were reading Tennessee Williams recently. Oh, yes. And that, I, I, I can imagine, is almost like the opposite experience to a certain degree to reading Morrison or something. Because one of the things that you mentioned was that it was extraordinary to experience the casualness of his racism. It's built in. in mm. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the world he was part of. I actually found a lot of links to Morrison in his work in the sense of his honesty about, particularly about women's experience, um, which I was really moved by. I mean, I think The Glass Menagerie, I think, was one. And, of course, Streetcar. There's a beauty to his writing that is to do with his humanity and his interest in, in human beings that just um, shines out. And I, and I feel it's the same thing that I find in Morrison. I find that in his... That's, that's why I kind of come back to him as well, yeah. Let's turn to music. You've already mentioned Bob Marley, but what music or other audio do you listen to while you're in the studio? I listen to quite a lot of jazz. I guess it's bebop era jazz. And I do have some particular favourites at the moment. Neymar by John Coltrane mm. and Just Squeeze Me, Miles Davis. I also recent, well, it feels recent in that it's like only 10 years or so. <laughs> but um, I've fallen in love with... Um, Sarah Vaughan. I used mm. to find her far too flowery almost. But I had this experience of being downstairs and I had the music on upstairs and I heard her voice and it was like a bell. It was so pure and um, it just made me love her. That's a lovely analogy. You mentioned Miles Davis there and there's a recent painting which, which is a direct quote in the title Kind of blue kind from, of blue. from Mars. Why did you choose that one? I mean, obviously it has got blue in it, but why use that one to reference Mars? That album, Kind of Blue, which was made in the year that I was born, oh. 1959, great year. That album, you know, is such an important work. And I think all the kind of I know, shades of emotion that he's exploring in that work, I felt was something of that in my painting, Kind of Blue. There's a musing quality. There's a quintet in So What and mm -hmm. all those seminal tracks that I hope there's a little bit of that in that work. So, yes, it's very rare for me to title a work after a piece of music, but it felt like there was a link. It felt right. It felt right, yeah. It's nice. What other media influence your work? Well, I, I do love sculpture. I do love seeing anything that's, you know, installation and sculpture and work that exists as a three-dimensional object in some sense. So I like being able to walk around and in and through a work. I really like Barbara Hepworth's sculpture. But, you know, I watch a lot of films and um, also like a lot of um, video work. But I suppose, yeah, maybe sculpture would be the, the mm. first. There's a reference to a body of work that I was almost taken aback to encounter in relation to your work, which was this book by Lenny Riefenstahl. And this was called People of Cow, and it was portraits of the Sudanese Nuba people. What was it that led you to that? Because obviously that must have been quite a difficult process, it seems to me. Riefenstahl's work was something that um, my friends and I came across and were all kind of disturbed by, as well as attracted. The reason being was that um, her work displays a very clear power relationship. She had the power to go out and to record these people in this culture when so many black photographers or black artists who might have liked access to the same people were unable to do that, didn't have the resources, didn't have the means. So I think it, it underlines the paucity of images that were available to me as a young black artist trying to work with black figuration. I think I mentioned before there were very few black models. I often had to turn to photographic sources. But of course it was very disturbing to me that one of the first sources that I was able to access had come through the lens of a, of a Nazi. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? 
I mean, I'd like to see the, the one I've said before about um, getting my hand moving and making some kind of small drawing when I walk into the studio. Is the discipline I'd like to say I do all the time, but I don't. I do it every now and again. Yeah, I suppose my rituals are kind of silly things about make a cup of tea, put some music on, um, open skip. the windows, skip, yeah, sometimes Tell skip. me about that. Do you, you skip in the studio? Yeah, I have, I have space enough to skip. And when I've been working for a bit, or if the work's going really well and I've got a piece of music on, but it also gets my shoulders rotating and they can get quite locked when I've been doing a lot of drawing. Are you working on the wall drawing or do you work on the floor? Oh, I work on an easel. Work on I an work easel. on a, I have a huge board on the easel and um, put the paper onto the board. And the same if I'm working on canvas, I'd work on the easel. But I do work on the wall as well, but I, I never work on the floor. I don't work flat. I'd always have the paper upright. And skipping can kind of release the body from the kind of tensions of those intense kind of yeah, sessions of exactly, drawing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's fun. Great. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? I want to say I'd quite like to have Studland Beach by Vanessa Bell. Oh, yeah. But... I think I, I'd really love to have a Rembrandt self-portrait, a late self-portrait. I just would. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel wrong for saying that because there are so many great women whose work I love, but it's the intensity and I, I feel like I look at his work and I recognise what he's doing. It's not four or five hundred years between us. It feels like it's now for me at work. In a conversation with John O'Comfrey, you talk about a kind of universality versus a specificity mm -hmm. it seems to me that that's encapsulated in those Rembrandt works absolutely because it's him obviously and he's just an aging Dutch man but what he's doing with paint it's timeless you know it belongs to everybody and it's for all time in my view <laughs> and lastly what's art for art makes life worth living I mean it's it's for everything I guess it's one of the last three places on earth you know you can go to you know, where there's nothing to restrict or bind you where you can be free Claudette thank you so much <laughs> thank you <laughs> Claudette Johnson presence is at the Courtauld in London from the 29th of September until the 14th of January 2024. Claudette's in the group show Women in Revolt at Tate Britain from the 8th of November until the 7th of April 2024. She features in a host of shows next year. She's in the group exhibition The Time is Always Now at the National Portrait Gallery from the 22nd of February to the 19th of May. She has a solo presentation at the Barber Institute in Birmingham, UK in late March and is taking on a commission from Art on the Underground, scheduled for November 2024. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every week. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. Production, editing, and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack, and A Brush With is produced by Lewis Jebb. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway. A big thank you to Claudette Johnson. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.